thanks everybody for having me here. I'm fresh off the Georgia neurosurgery meeting, so I feel like I'm doing like a cell, southeastern neurosurgery uh, tour here. How, how many of you guys are surgeons? Okay. And anybody? Everybody's fine, or yes? Okay. Cool. Um, what? We like you or not, we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So, um, so yeah. Thanks, Amber, for having me. I um, given a talk, this talk today, and then tomorrow will be a fun talk on social media and branding. Um, but um, I just asked Amber, like, what what we should talk about today, and um, this is something that I've incorporated in my practice uh, since 2020, and I think it's an important topic. So I'm excited to talk about it, and we can keep this casual. Um, so feel free to ask any questions during the talk, um, and I'll try to keep on time. I had to put the Jordan picture in there because this is like the only time I've seen you guys in 2022 National Championship, so anyway, sorry about that. Um, so like like you said, um, I was born and raised in Gainesville, Georgia. That's where I practice, so I actually practice at the hospital I was born at, so it's kind of come full circle for me. Um, this wasn't too far of a drive. I think it took us five hours to get here, so. I'm excited to, to, I've never been to Fairhope, so it's kind of fun. Hopefully the rain goes away so we can enjoy it. Um, but I'm here with my family. If you guys see me out at the pool or whatever, come say hi. Um, so what is the most common procedure that we do in spine? Micro disc, transfusion, what do you guys say? There's 470, 450,000 micro discectomies a year and in the lumbar spine alone. And there's about 475 fusions that includes all of the spine so I was a little surprised by that so probably one of the most common procedures we do is lumbar microdiscectomies and um, I just want to kind of show this case um, as an example we'll come back to it at the end but this is a patient of mine she's actually a, a good friend of mine also a Georgia fan uh, she's a nurse in our emergency <coughs> department and she's very athletic does CrossFit this is her 2012 MRI of her lumbar spine she was about 30 at this time chronic lower back pain, nothing debilitating, just kind of managed it. As you can see, she has like a little annular, you know, bulging disc at 4551, nothing, nothing too bad, but she was looking at a patient in the ER and uh, began to develop some pain that radiated down her right leg in 2020, right during the pandemic. And um, we tried therapy and injections. It was pretty intractable, her sciatica on the right side. And so, um, it, you know, she has a 51 right-sided disc protrusion and um, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't uh, too bad on the MRI, but she was in debilitating pain. So um, we tried all the things, and eventually we came to she needed a microdiscectomy. Pretty easy surgery, it's gonna be fine. Go back to the ER, go back to nursing. A couple, you know, six weeks recovery, just no BLTs. And um, I talked to her about the barricade at the time. I was using annular closure, and I was denied, which we'll talk about here in a little bit too. But um, that uh, prevents disc-free herniation. So, you know, whatever. We'll just do the standard microdiscectomy. So she did great. Uh, eight weeks in, I think she went back to work at six weeks, still, you know, on modified duty. And then about 12 weeks later, about three months later, she uh, had worsening pain. Not quite as bad as the first time around but her pain came back. And you can see the disc was actually probably even a little bigger than it was the first time around. So she was um, obviously devastated. And um, we talked about the options. And I told her, Melanie, look, we can go back in and go another microsectomy. Um, I really think, you know, probably we could do the revision discectomy or do a disc replacement. I really don't want to do a fusion. Um, and um, so she said, okay, let's do a disc replacement. Denied. So we have Sigma, it's a big carrier in our area. I know Blue Cross is the majority down here, which is probably similar coverage. So again, uncovered procedure, not, not medically necessary, blah, blah, blah. So she's like, I, I just really don't think I can go through another discectomy. I'm worried about reperniating. Um, so let's just do the fusion. So we did the ALA. Um, this was our post-op MRI, she did great. Um, a year out, she started doing CrossFit again. And, um, <clears throat> 2022. Yes. Did you not do the redo discectomy? No, the... she opted for the fusion. I gave her the option of revision discectomy versus fusion, and she did not want to do another discectomy again. She just wanted. She was really worried about reperniating. So. But you yeah. you did the ALA without the redo discectomy. Correct. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I know some people have like a two or three strikes 
my, my, uh, at the, at the revision discectomy, I'll often talk to them about other options and try to give them the choice with discussing the risks involved. And so for her, she decided that she just wanted to do it. So we did that. Um, and she's a pretty knowledgeable woman. So, um, anyway, so, so now, you know, fast forward a couple of years later, now she's re injured at four or five and has, um, new sciatica. So this is the, this is the, the what we see every day in our practice. You guys have seen it every single day. Uh, spine is a gift that keeps on giving, but doesn't really have to be, right? So if we could somehow intervene in the index procedure of a discectomy, one of the most common procedures we do in spine, could we change the life of our patient? Um, could we prevent this problem from happening? And it's not always, you know, Melanie's unique because she's been my patient since the beginning, but we often see patients that come to us as have five, six, seven, eight back surgeries. And if you think back as to what actually happened at the first that kind of introduced them into, into the spine world, um, often you'll find it's something simple like this. And um, so that's kind of what I want to talk about today. So discectomy, the history of discectomy is kind of interesting. So, um, and um, I need some better glasses. Uh, in 1908, sorry, the first discectomy was done in Berlin. And um, it's kind of interesting, just the history. Then we did the procedure lines, discectomy MRIs in 77, microscope, surgical microscope in 76, and then 97 we, we had the twos. Actually endoscopy came before that, I didn't know that, but endoscopy was around since 1993. Um, and then since 97, since we've done twos, really no major innovation in discectomy, which is crazy, right? That's over 25 years ago. Um, and there's been lots of annular closure devices that have come up along the way. Does any, has anybody tried any? these devices. I used to use X those for a long time. We'll go through the history of some of that. So it's an interesting um, kind of <coughs> area of our of our uh, field that really has gone unserved. Um, and we know that there's a clinical need, right? You guys all see that disc in Melanie. It's this huge disc. You get in there, you see this huge tear, and you're like, oh, crap, like what am I going to do? It's going to be pretty neat. You have to take care. So we have two choices. <coughs> we either Remove the sequester fragment, kind of hope for the best, leaving the native disc in place, because that's the right thing to do. We go in there, we just go to town. We take all the nucleus out, we just do our best to kind of remove everything we see because we don't want it to re herniate. And so that's because we know that these large defects have a high risk of recurrence, and I'll go through the data. Um, but we do have seen in studies that preserving the disc material is actually the best thing we can do. We don't really want to go in there and gut the nucleus because you're going to have progressive degenerative disc disease, disc collapse, stress on the facets. And we know that they'll have, you know, probably some persistent back and leg pain, whether or not it's tolerable or intolerable, remains to be seen over time. But um, so we have our choices are doing the aggressive discectomy with a less risk of disc re herniation, but a higher risk of progressive back and leg pain over time, or do a minimally, you know, uh, limited discectomy and have a higher risk of recurrence. Um, yeah. So. And then the facet, you know, facets are stressed if you kind of got the disc. So a third of discectomy patients have big holes, and by big holes we mean six, six millimeters or more. There's a Carahee study in, uh, in the early 2000s in which he identified those patients that are at higher risk are six millimeters. Um, this is the, uh, the comparison study of, um, of a, a slit defect, which again classified as less than six millimeters or greater than six millimeters. And you can see the vast difference. Right, the green is the recurrent disc herniation over 25% risk, but if they have a smaller defect, the, the risk is small. So we're really talking about this large group of patients that have a pretty big defect, and sometimes the defect isn't what we create with, with our instruments when we go in there. So we can easily make a big hole if we're, um, if we're you know, placing a lot of instruments or a knife or whatever into the disc. So this is kind of what we're gonna go through. Um, and so, obviously, the goals of discectomy, treat sciatica, prevent recurrent disc herniation, reduce back pain, and avoid acceleration of the degenerative process. Has anybody in here ever had a disc herniation? Couple? Three? Any of you have surgery? No way. One? <laughs> no way, yeah. So I actually, yes? Well, this gentleman uh, told me not to. But it was a week before, or it was like a month before my wedding, so I needed to walk down the aisle. Oh, I had an option. <laughs> Jeez, yeah, so I've also uh, 
three months postpartum with my son, bent over, picked up something out of a bassinet in front of the desk, and I was, <clears throat> knew instantly that's what happened. It's probably the most terrifying moment of my life because I was worried about all the things that we're going to talk about. But, but, um, but yeah, I mean, so discectomy outcomes, we all see it in our practice. You're going to do great. It's, you know, you're going to get back out there. You're going to walk down the aisle. Um, and you're, you know, it's minimally invasive. You're gonna, it's quick recovery. Ninety percent of patients do just fine. But are the results really that good? So if we go through some of the data on discectomy, and these are some of the um, some of the studies. Uh, the Swedish Spine Registry study: 70, seventy-six percent patient satisfaction at a year. Washington State: fifteen percent reoperation rate. Um, and the Finnish study: eighteen point nine percent reoperation rate at nine years. And it's for some of the things we talked about: recurrent disc herniation being the most common reason for reoperation. <clears throat> and they fail because of that, or because of progressive back pain from degenerative disc disease. Um, <clears throat> and so the the literature rate of herniation is three to eighteen percent. We, like I pointed out, um, it's greater in those patients with those large defects. Um, and the aggressive uh, removal of discs um, will reduce that risk, but that can lead to progressive degenerative disc disease. These are the studies that I quoted earlier. This is the water study in 2009, um, showing the, the, the uh, table that I showed earlier with the aggressive versus conservative discectomy. Um, this is the CARIB-D study that identified the annular defect size, six millimeters being what we classify as a large defect. Um, and then the um, McGurk study in 2009 that shows that limited versus aggressive discectomy can cause, uh, would a more aggressive discectomy cause more back pain over time. And then, um, then the disc height loss. The, the, this study is interesting because it shows the volume of disc removed was the only relevant uh, data point that was statistically significant was uh, that they had progressive height loss with the, uh, with the increased volume of uh, disc removed. <clears throat> the Tomei study um, showed that the recurrent disc herniation is higher in the sequestrectomy versus uh, a discectomy. So there's this talk like in the early, it's kind of interesting that uh, uh, we were reviewing history for this talk, but it seems like there's a lot of chatter in the literature around the early 2000s about this, um, about what do we do about defects and discectomies, and all these papers were published around that time. And so I think it's kind of this, 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 uh, transcending change of surgeons and like the phasing out of uh, older surgeons that were more tuned to doing aggressive discectomies and the newer phases of surgeons where we start talking about pelvic incidents and preserving disc height and we're going to keep maintaining the alignment and so this seems to be a common theme but that we want to <coughs> preserve disc um, and so that comes to how do we do that and what can we do to, to we know that removing less disc is good the data shows that we know that we're going to preserve patients from chronic pain so you had all these companies that started looking into annular repair and how can we reduce the risk in these patients. <clears throat> and the problem is the space is really challenging. I mean, obviously uh, it takes on a lot of high pressure, but we're 330 PSI is what a lumbar disc on the fish um, study show is the stresses that it takes. Um, extreme loads, bending flexion, <clears throat> high degrees of range of motion, and, um, and poor healing. I mean, that disc really is poorly vascularized, so it doesn't really heal. Um, so, <coughs> got allergies, I didn't take my allergies this morning, I'm sorry. <coughs> so these <coughs> were all the kind of things that have been talked about preventing suture devices, glue devices, even implants. Um, and, it, and it's kind of interesting the types of technologies that came out. <clears throat> some of these were in humans and some were not, but these are all the kind of the um, patents that have been placed on annular technologies. This is the Annulex device that was developed. Again, all these were probably in the early and mid 2000s. Um, but it was a device where you implant it into the annulus and kind of inflate it and it stays in there. Um, and that technology, you know, kind of, it, it makes sense, but uh, it, did, it didn't work and the company went out of business. Now this x closes device was actually pretty, I used this for a while. Um, it was out there 
in, um, in hospitals and, and got to use a fair amount. And it made sense. I mean, essentially it was like an anchor device. You'd place this little um, like pointer thing into the annulus on one side and then it stuck this like piece of rice bead up underneath the annulus and then you'd go on the other side and it would suture it closed. And it looked really cool and whenever you could get it to like hold in the annulus, it was kind of exciting. But um, I have many re herniations even through that because it's just a suture you can pop it. So this company actually had um, developed this large uh, clinical trial to kind of prove their data and it was it was a new point. It was, no, it was not statistically significant to be any better than not doing anything. And then they, they um, ended up trying to do a, a trial and didn't get an ID um, clearance and then the FDA shut them down. So that went out. Uh, this is from the Georgia Tech Labs, kind of a cool technology um, that <clears throat> never actually got tested in humans, but uh, you inject this into the disc in hopes of regeneration cartilage. Um, this is Warsaw Orthopedics. This is never, again, I don't think this actually got implanted into humans, but uh, this was a subsidiary of Medtronic. And so they came up with all these kind of cool thoughts and patents. Um, this was some of their patches that they created that you <coughs> sew into one vertebral body and then sew it into the other vertebral body <coughs> to hold the patch in place. <coughs> and then this is some of their other um, structures from their patents, all interesting stuff. I think the, um, those are all just patterns. And then ANOVA came in. Again, these are all just kind of thoughts and ideas on how to prevent the disc re herniation. And this, this technology um, had a FDA 10, 510K clearance for containment. So like doing a fusion and putting this in there to contain the bone graft to prevent it from extruding. So it really wasn't, uh, it was thought to be also used for annular closure, but <clears throat> this is um, their, one of their thoughts. It's kind of like a suction cup thing that you stick in the disc and then implant it and kind of be like expand to cover that defect. And uh, some of the, this was was kind of weird. The bottom one was, is, looks like a little, I don't know, like a, a shrimp or something you stick in there, all these little bars. <laughs> Reminds me of those shunts. Do you remember those shunts that people put in that you sometimes see on the kids, but put the bars in there? So that didn't work either. They came out. Um, <coughs> and then here are some other <coughs> things. Let's see. And then uh, Depew came into play and they developed this sub, small intestinal submucosal. Um, uh, enter into the disc, it's biocompatible, um, but it, 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 they did it in the bench top studies and it didn't really prove to be uh, uh, beneficial. You kind of took the small intestine, twirled around and stuck it into this space. It had a lot of inflammatory um, reactions in, in the bench top study. Uh, this one is, uh, is interesting because the DART device is actually listed in Blue Cross Blue Shield Alabama's policy as an exclusion of annular closure, which never actually made it into the United States. So it's kind of interesting um, looking at the policy that they specifically point out this implant as being uh, something you can't put in, we can't even put it in the United States, but it is on Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama's exclusion policy along with Barricade, which we're going to talk about. But this device is just, so if you ever see the DART um, listed on the policy, this is what it is. It's a peak device that you shove into the annular defect and um, and it plugs, plugs the hole. but it did have some, it, it was used in Europe, but uh, the pilot study, again, didn't have any good uh, results and the company didn't proceed with this. So it's never, it's been off market for over 10 years. This one looks kind of like a spider. You shove it in the disc space and you expand it. Um, it's from Newberg Technologies called the Octopus. Um, and then finally the barricade. So um, this is the initial, uh, development of the barricade, which was basically like you would you would put it into the angular defect and expand it, and then it would kind of cover the whole back part of the disc. But they found on uh, studies over times these are CTs that was done that the actual implant migrated. So the company went back and they tried to develop something else that maybe worked a little better. So they developed a new type of one that had more of a like pronged type end in hopes that that would prevent it from migrating. But again, these are follow-up studies. This was in 2005. Um, and again, it still migrated and came out. So they went back to the bench again. And it's pretty amazing in three years they came up with this. Um, and this is the final product. Um, it was redesigned for 2005 to 2008 with some minor changes. But this is what it is now. And essentially, I kind of think of it like 
in my mind, is kind of like an anchor, like when you go, uh, I don't, obviously I'm neuro, but in shoulders and hips, you know, you use anchors to tack up the cartilage, and so this is kind of similar. It's a bone anchor um, with, a, with a mesh polymer that will hold up the, um, the cartilage into place. So they tested it on the bench. It was a good, uh, it seemed to perform really well in bench top studies, so they needed to run some studies on humans. Um, but this is essentially how you do the barricade. So you'll identify the annular defect, measure it, um, that little, the left-hand side um, here. No. Okay. The, is how you measure the defect. So it needs to be a large defect, four, four millimeters tall, six millimeters wide. Um, so they have little measuring devices here. This is the trial and then the implant that you'll put in. I'm just gonna do a little video here. So after you do your discectomy um, and your trial, essentially you just um, place the anchor into place and as it deploys, the polymer mesh flips up to kind of protect any extrusion of the nucleus. And that's what it looks like with fluoroscopy images. The implant's only eight millimeters wide, so you're not having to remove the set or anything like that. And that's what it looks like after it's deployed. So they were happy with this development and then um, uh, went to work with start to do an RCT so we could see how it performed um, in, in the <coughs> real people. So <clears throat> the long-term results showed, thank you. <coughs> okay. um, so again, this is the background of the study like we talked about earlier. Uh, they wanted to prove that doing minimal discectomy and having this implant uh, of the annular closure device will kind of uh, serve long-term benefits. So it was a multi-center randomized control superiority study, one, one randomized barricade versus uh, the, the standard discectomy. Um, inclusion criteria, obviously all the things that we do, they felt conservative treatment, um, they have certain oswestry and BAS scores, and then they track them uh, up to 24 months. So those 21 sites that enrolled in the study, 554 patients, this was in 2010 to 2014. Um, and then it was published in JAMA in 2022 with five-year data. So this is the, the results of the study. They found that, um, that it validated that it did reduce uh, disc reherniation in these patients with the slit defects. Um, Reoperation rate was low, and the uh, reherniation rate uh, was statistically uh, lo lower. Um, and this is the the Carragy study, kind of putting it in there, um, with the blue being the barricade, the RCT in the red, and then the Carragy study, which was the earlier study that I showed earlier. And you can see that reherniation and reoperation rates were low, less than 50%, or excuse me, those 50% reduction in reherniation in the barricade population. Um, and that was clinically significant. This is kind of charted out on an easier to understand diagram. So over time, and I found this interesting that even like, you know, as patients go out further and further, their risk of reherniation continues to go up over time. So this is tracked out to five years um, with the uh, patients that experience reherniation versus hospital readmission versus reoperation. And then you can see uh, sustained with the barricade that that perceived benefit is persistent over time. So it doesn't, you know, work just initially and then kind of fail. So, um, so they, uh, they've received FDA clearance and, um, and, and um, it's been, I think over 10,000 implants have been put in since that time. Um, myself, I think I've put in maybe 60 or 70 since 2020. Um, so this is where we come into play. Um, we, we start talking about these types of new implants, new technology. You have those annoying reps that come into your practice and say, I've got this new product, I want you to see it. It works really good, let me show you my study. And you know, you're like, I don't believe that. Um, you have two, two people, two types of surgeons. You have the clinical skeptic that's like, nope, I need to see the data, or the economic skeptic that's like, this is too costly to my hospital, to my surgery center, whatever. I need to see the numbers. So, so we'll go through all that. Um, and I like this comparison because I'm the same way. And uh, so you have the clinical skeptic. I don't have re herniations. Or I've tried something in the past, didn't work, so this ain't gonna work either. 
or re-herniations happen, they're not a big deal. It's, it, it's inevitable, right? We're, we, that's my gift that keeps on giving. I get more surgeries out of this patient. Um, you know, it is just the nature of, of the problem. Or you have the, the surgeons that want to see the data. So let's address all of these. You have a surgeon that says, I don't have re-herniations. Well, we know that's false, right? I just want to do the data. Um, they either, they maybe not see it in their practice, but it's very obvious there is a risk of re-herniation in patients with large annular defects. And this study was published in 2003, well before, before the barricade even received the FDA approval. So this device uh, was not created. This study was done well. We knew this was a problem a long time ago, I guess is the point. Um, so again, 73% of all reoperations come from those patients with large defects. Previous technology has failed. Um, yeah, well, that's true. I just showed you all of the previous failed technology. That is exactly true, but the barricade has been shown um, that in, 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 in humans and in the benchtop that it does solve this issue. And this benchtop study showing uh, cadaver specimens with annular defects re-herniated within a few cycles of stress on the disc, and then the barricade patients uh, survived up to 100,000 cycles without re-herniation, and this study was published in 2012. Um, and again, like I said, barricade is effective in preventing re herniation and reoperations with a, with a clinically statistical, statistical um, significance. Re herniations aren't a big deal. Well, they are. Um, and, you know, it may not be a big deal to us because we see it all the time, but what if it was your mom? What if it was your wife or your husband that had this disc herniation and had to have another surgery? How would you think of it then? It's a big deal. Um, to Melanie, it's a big deal. She's, she's my friend. Um, this is tough, um, and certainly if it was any of your backs, you know, having any type of operation is a big deal. So we really need to think about that. And 53% of reoperations, like in her case earlier, are fusions. And if we want to talk about the economics of that, that's huge, not only from a money standpoint, but from an out-of-work standpoint, from a permanent disability standpoint, from these patients that end up being persistent <coughs> spine patients over time. So if we talk about discectomies and returning to work, um, barricade patients return to work at half the time, on average 3.6 uh, weeks compared to 6.4 weeks in, in patients without the barricade, and then 92% uh, of them are back to work in 90 days. Are there any superiority studies? Well, yes, we just went through that. Um, and there's actually been many, many studies um, done in, in this uh, group and the overall weighted reduction is 81% reduction in reoperations. There's over 70 studies. Happy to show you any of these studies, but there's tons of data that support that this device works. Are there any real-world studies? Um, I see all the you know data on this now, but this it doesn't actually really work. So this is a study that um, that I've been working on uh, with some colleagues at seven sites, and this is our data. Um, it hasn't been published yet, but will be soon. So we had 121 levels, 118 subjects implanted at seven sites with three months of follow-up. And um, it was, again, a single arm study. So our age, um, 45 on average, and um, uh, BMI 31, and our three months re herniation rate was 4%. So five out of 121 patients, and this is very similar to the other studies. No device migrations, fractures, or any devices that were explanted. Um, and this is kind of our real world study on the left compared to the Nunley study um, and then the two randomized control trials, which is pretty similar. Um, I would argue that a re reperdiation re reoperation rate is a little higher, um, but if you look at the control group, it is lower. Um, so, I again, this is my experience to date. Um, I've been implanting since August of 2020 initially. Um, it's hard to get this device approved. It's been a lot easier in the past 12 months because uh, Cigna changed their coverage policy last year. But before, it was almost impossible for me to get any of these approved. So that's probably why I haven't done as many as I, as, uh, I would have been able to do. Um, but we had 119 patients identified preoperatively and then 54 went on and most of that was because of insurance denial. Um, and again, it's not something, when I talk to my patients about it, it's not like, um, you're definitely going to get the barricade. So if you're doing a microdisectomy, and depending on what we see intraoperatively, the, on the size of the annular defect, we'll decide whether or not you need to implant. Um, and then, you know, 
that too small, we're not going to do it. Um, or if it's not anatomically accessible, we're not going to do it. So, um, so the patients understand that they may or may not get it. Um, and then 33 patients, um, so 54 patients were intraoperatively a candidate for the barricade and 33 were implanted. And again, those, uh, those, the difference in those 20-something patients were um, probably more anatomic, like I couldn't get it in because nerve root or uh, et cetera. So um, this is just a reimbursement, which I'll talk about in the economic skeptic part in just a minute. But um, this is the reimbursement data that we collected. On average, the facility reimbursement was $11,000. And then the average surgeon reimbursement, this is kind of a part of the problem with this device. Right now, we're having to use the 22899 code, which are familiar with CPT code, that's a miscellaneous code, so it kind of sucks. Uh, but um, on average, um, it's about an $810 reimbursement, which is similar or even a little bit higher than an ACDF plate. And it takes me five minutes. And more importantly, more than the, the reimbursement, it's what's right for the patient. So um, again, this year, hopefully later in the fall, uh, we would go into the AMA to hopefully get the CBT code changed, very similar to how Coflex got their own code. Um, so that will hopefully change uh, in this calendar year. So back to the economic skeptic, you have the surgeon that wants to know, is this a product looking for a procedure? Is my facility going to be reimbursed? But how am I going to get paid? Um, and prove the reimbursement to me because I don't believe that I'm going to do all this work and then get paid for it. Um, so is this a product looking for a procedure? Again, we uh, spoke earlier about the benchtop study that was done well before the, the Karagi study, study, excuse me, to identify the, the large defects are a problem, and um, CMS uh, clearly identifies a difference in annular size tears. These are the CPT codes identifying a large lumbar tear defect versus a small. So there is differences in the coding, which means that the CMS identifies that there is a difference in the clinical problem that is presented uh, with these two diagnoses. Will my facility be re reimbursed, either the hospital or ASCD? Any of y'all operate ASCs? Um, hospital, you know, will want to know this too, but the C9757 code is the facility code uh, that the hospital will bill um, for the implant. And this is on average what you'll get um, at the, this is the Medicare, but it's on average about the same. And you'll see the, the hospital gets paid more for the, bar for the barricade, but again, that's going to include the implant, which is less uh, than the difference. So the hospital will make money, it's a lot of money off of doing a uh, barricade. This is the difference in um, with the ASC code, but again, I don't think any of you guys operate at ASC. So you use your standard discectomy code, the 63030 code that we all use for discectomy, and then the 2289 miscellaneous code is what you'll um, submit. And then the prior authorization is what you'll have to do on the front end, which um, it's sometimes a little bit of a challenge. You'll have to do peer to peer for the 22899 code because that will usually fire some kind of question. Um, and I'll usually explain that to the patient, you know, how to go through the appeals process, etc. Some of them are willing to do it. Some of them are like, I, you've got to get this. I'm in too much pain. I don't feel like dealing with that. So, you know, you can proceed without it. But there is, um, I usually have all of my prior offs go through the intrinsic. Um, prior authorization team. Um, they really kind of fine tune everything, cross the keys, dot the I's to submit it for reimbursement. And they also have a patient first program I'll talk briefly about, but if anybody has any interest, we can definitely talk more about that. But essentially what it is is a program through the company that if it gets denied on the front end, that you can still, if the patient meets certain criteria, can still get it implanted. And then post implantation, you can appeal it. And if it still gets denied on the back end, the, the company will pay for the implant. And um, it's really, it's really a nice concept. You think, man, the company's going to get a lot of money, but in fact, with all the patients that I've implanted under this program, it's like 90% coverage rate on the post-implantation appeals. So it actually gets covered after you implant it. This is just the data I showed a minute ago on the plans review. So that should satisfy any of you guys that have questions on, on that. Um, so just gonna go through a couple of cases here. Um, again, 73 year old female, she's never had surgery before. She came to me with radiculopathy. She failed conservative treatment and then had, you know, kind of some facet hypertrophy, ligamentum hypertrophy, but this disc herniation as well. So we did 
Um, this is not her, this is 5-1, obviously, but this is just for example purposes. We did a minimally invasive tubular microdiscectomy. Her annular defect was four by six millimeters and uh, ended up implanting an eight millimeter implant. This shows that you have to have, obviously, a defect that goes all the way into the nucleus because the implants can go all the way in there. So you have to identify that. And then this is an intraoperative fluoroscopy from hers. So we did the um, trial, and this is kind of how you'll trial it. You'll notch the um, uh, trial up against the end of the vertebral body and just make sure that it's going to seat and fit. You can retract it during the nerve root. You don't have to remove, it's not a whole lot more bone work than what you would traditionally do. Maybe just a slight amount of medial facet and a little bit more medial bone. But um, once you identify whether or not you need an 8 or a 10 millimeter, you'll um, then proceed with the implantation. And you want to make sure that your retractors, if you do an open, it's the same thing too, uh, or MIS, but you'll want to make sure that it's parallel with the end plate because that's the key. You don't want to kind of cattywamp this in there. It needs to be exactly parallel, and sometimes you have to kind of remove your retractors. It's important to make sure you're looking at that before you make your incision if you're doing it minimally invasive to make sure it's exactly parallel. And then once you implant it, that's what it looks like. Um, you can see the mesh polymer flipped up and the, the little tantalum marker there in place. So you'll countersink it just a few millimeters. Um, I wanted to share this video because I think it's really powerful. These are, this is a story of Melanie. Um, and this is also Maria, who's also an a, a ICU nurse that I worked with. And I think- um, I was doing bedside nursing. I was active, I, I loved outside activities, used to take my dog out for runs. I was starting having severe symptoms when my leg was numb and I couldn't walk at times. When I started having these severe symptoms, I was wondering if this pain continues, will I be able to continue to do my job as a nurse? Will I be able to function in an ER setting? Um, also as a mom and a wife, will I be able to take care of my children and, and my family at home? Got the news 24 hours after the MRI telling me that my disc was herniated. I felt like uh, pain management was just gonna be a band-aid to the bigger picture. So I decided to opt for the surgery. I told them I did not want a band-aid for my symptoms, that I wanted um, to be pain-free. I, 